My name is Christina Shutt, and I'm proud to be the executive director for your nationally accredited African American History and Culture Museum. Our mission is to preserve, interpret, and celebrate African American history and culture here in Arkansas. We are thrilled that you are joining us for the celebration of our newest exhibit, We Hold These Truths, American Veterans of Arkansas, featuring the photography of Ed Drew. It's incredible to be standing in this exhibition amongst Arkansas veterans whose bodies personify the values that we hold dear, the founding principles of America, that of life and liberty and freedom, to stand against tyranny and oppression. In a time when our country is publicly struggling to live out its principles that all people are created equal, these individuals have fought and continue to fight to protect those values hold dear. And tonight we are honored to be joined by two of those veterans, Ed Drew and Kruoski Salter. Ed Drew grew up in New York City and joined the Air Force after graduating from high school, where he was stationed near Tokyo, Japan. In 2009, he joined the California Air National Guard as a combat search and rescue helicopter gunner. Deploying to Afghanistan in the spring of 2013, he created his first major body of work there. While in the Air National Guard, he also attended the San Francisco Art Institute, receiving a BFA in sculpture with a minor in photography, where he studied under photographers Linda Connor, Lonnie Graham, and Henry Wessel, Jr. Kurowski A. Salter is a United States retired colonel currently serving as executive director of the First Division Museum, where he is expanding military history interpretations through the lens of the First Infantry Division. Within his first year, the museum has added half a dozen new and inclusive interpretations associated with the First Infantry Division. He is also a guest associate curator and military subject matter expert at the Smithsonian Institution National Museum of African American History and Culture, where he curated the permanent inaugural exhibition titled Double Victory, the African American Military Experience, and the temporary exhibition We Return Fighting, the African American Experience in World War I, which opened on December 13, 2019. Karaski is the author, contributing author, advisor, and or editor to more than seven books, including The Story of Black Military Officers, 1861 to 1948, which was published in 2014. He holds a Bachelor of Science from the University of Florida, where he was a distinguished military graduate, a Master of Strategic Studies from the Air War University, and a Master's and PhD from Florida State University, where he studied military history and African-American history. A trained United States Army Airborne Ranger who commanded at every level through battalion, Dr. Salter served as a senior staff officer at the Pentagon before retiring from the military. After a short video, we'll be joined in conversation to talk about the newest exhibition at Mosaic Templars Cultural Center. And we invite you to send us your questions for these men in the live Facebook feed, as well as share this content through Facebook by hosting a virtual watch party. As I was looking at the exhibition today, I was reminded of words from United States Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, who said, where you see wrong, or inequality or in injustice, speak out, because this is your country. This is your democracy. Make it, protect it, pass it on. The individuals photographed in this exhibition have done that, not just in military service, but in their everyday civilian lives. They understand that this is your democracy, and it matters what you do with it. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the program. My name is Ed Drew. I'm an artist and I created the series We Hold These Truths, American Veterans of Arkansas on display in the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center at Heritage Museum of Arkansas.
um, when when people look at the series, I really don't want them to consider us so much as military people or people that were in the military. As I want us to first think of us, I want them to first think of us as people, always people. That's why I didn't stress that they wear their uniforms or bring uniform items. I think there's one person or two, three people with uniform items. Only because they chose to. But it was something they asked, like, oh, should I wear my uniform? I'm like, wear a t-shirt. <laughs> wear, a, you know, an A-shirt, tank top if you want. I don't care what you wear. Show me what, who you are and what you want me to show to other people. My intent was to give people a voice, and I allowed them to have that voice. By uh, I would spend two hours sometimes talking to them before I took the photo. And, and that's the strength of my work, is the person. And that's what I care about. I care about the person. And oh yeah, I took this photo. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I was born and raised in uh, in Brooklyn. Um, I grew up in Bensonhurst, and at the time, it was primarily Italian Americans. Who I am influences everything I do in my artwork. So even the notions of black veterans and, and my ideas of why I want to do these photos and stuff has something to do with my upbringing. So growing up in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, New York, surrounded by Italian Americans. Um, I did not have a great sense of who I was as a person, especially as a black male. I got it because the notion of being black in America is, is less, is to be lesser. It's in everything. So um, even though I was raised in this, this part of New York City um, that is considered or was considered racist and, and just xenophobic. I never had a problem, but I still got the notions and, and uh, that's in my upbringing that was really important. So that's where I was from. Uh, and then I joined the military when I was 18. A really important aspect of, of, this, of this series was the transformation within myself um, that I really want people to understand. I struggled with being black growing up again it wasn't external it wasn't an external force directly it was kind of like a within the narrative of the country um i hated being black i i ultimately remember tears being shed because i was so upset about being black and i was angry at my mom for being with a black person because she was puerto rican i was like if i was puerto rican at least i could kind of have straight hair and I wouldn't look so, like, I wouldn't have this wide nose and stuff as much. And that, thinking about it now, I'm like, oh, goodness, you know, that's just a terrible way of thinking about oneself. But I maintained that self-hatred for a long time. So this series was, is also part of an effort of reconciliation not just with the, you know, changing the dynamic of the country's operating system, but it's also um, a way for me to, to love myself and in it love other black people. I'm saying I need, I, I need to find that pride that this, this country denies us. Um, and it's really good to the point where people within our, our race, uh, within black people's black race, are much like me or when I was growing up there's I'm not special and I would convey this to some of the people who sat for me and, and they weren't surprised at all they were like yeah you know like, that's that's not a special thing there's a lot of black people who just don't have any self-appreciation and who hate themselves what the series did for me when I met these people was it, it really it gave me pride so many, most of those people in, in those photos are accomplished with not only degrees, but also like within life, a, a strong, you know, a religious, they have strong characters is what I mean. So, it, you know, they degrees, um, 
accomplishments in the military, strong characters, all these positive things. And it made me feel so proud to be who I was. And I think that's really important. I think everybody should be proud of who they are. And, um, and, and this series did that for me. And I, I would walk away after the photo and I, I'd be smiling because I was like, wow, that person is, man, I feel good about myself. So, um, I, I hope it does that for other people. I, I really hope this series can have a, a young black boy and a young white kid or Asian or whoever look at these individuals and feel some sort of pride in, in either humanity or themselves or, or just the spirit of, of, of um, art and, and, and what people can accomplish. Good afternoon, everyone. And Ed, how are you doing this evening? Good. Pretty good. Okay, well, great. I, I've been told for a couple of weeks that we were going to start with a, uh, a video. I had not seen that before, but that is a, uh, a great intro to a lot of what we can discuss tonight. And it throws my first question a little out of whack because you covered some of this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. You know, I was on your website. And I really love this quote. And by the way, uh, I'm Krawalski Salter, and thank you, Christina, and your teammates for inviting me to be the moderator and the host for this evening. But on your website, you say, I consider myself an artist and a storyteller using a camera. So some of what you didn't talk about in the intro, you know, walk us through a little bit about the origins of how Ed Drew became this artist with a camera? Um, I think, I think for me, it, it extended to um, wanting to, to say more than I was capable of, of use, you know, using my uh, language for. Like for me, photography and, and art in general is just an extension of my language. And I had, um, or still have a really active imagination so um, I kind of like take different aspects within this world to explain myself because perhaps uh, um, I want to capture a moment and I don't know how to speak those words that would encompass that moment. So I found photography to be one of the better tools for me to uh, express myself uh, conceptually as well as um, literally. Okay, great. So did that start in high school or when you joined the military or when you got out of the military the first time and went back to school? Uh, for photography or art? Photography, photography. Okay, um, so I think, well, photography really is an extension of uh, just the natural creativity that I've, I've always possessed. Um, I do know that when I was younger, um, part of the escape for me from New York City um, was a, um, the ability to read National Geographic magazines and, and really, really kind of escape into this beautiful world that was brought to me by photographs. And so uh, when I turned 16, my father died and uh, he left uh, a chunk of money and I had basically begged my mom for a camera and, and for me, like things just kind of when I see them, they just kind of rattle in my brain and I am like can't even sleep thinking about it. And so when I got the camera, um, finally, um, I couldn't be separated from it. I mean, I had it everywhere with me. I brought it to prom. I was more focused on taking photos than actually dancing with my date. Um, it, it And then it, it went. I joined the military and then I was taking photos whenever and wherever I could. 
And uh, I, I think that was, um, it, it just drew me. It was just such a magical thing to hold a camera. And to this day, it still is magical to have a camera and take photos. Um, I never get tired of doing it. And that is obvious because I have seen the uh, exhibition and in the last couple of days I read uh, every word and I've uh, had the chance to see every image. So let's segue. So and you talked about conceptualization. So, you know, I'm a historian. I'm used to putting uh, words on paper and trying to articulate as best I can what I want to say. Uh, but you have done it so well in this exhibition. So walk us through the exhibition from the beginning, the title, you know, uh, synopsize it, uh, and talk a little bit about some of the items, not only the images, but you have some documents in there. And so, you know, I came up with this phrase. Uh, this is, in a sense, a simplistic exhibition, but extremely complex. So talk about how you weave all of what you have in this exhibition together by using your images. Uh, wow, that's, that's, that's uh, far deeper than, than I, I would think about. Well, your exhibition is deep. So for example, you have the images, you have the Declaration of Independence, you have the Constitution, you have the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, you have Executive Order 9981, you have four letters from Civil War soldiers, uh, you have a couple of items, um, and the images are mostly current day images, but the type of photography you use is a Civil War technique, so that's complex. So, you know, uh, we sum that together for us. I think it all really comes from my, um, believe it or not, my patriotism. Um, my, my desire to, to have this country be what it says it should be, and it's not yet. I mean, don't get me wrong, America is, is a great country, and, and I have so many gifts because of it, but we could be so much better. And so how I engage uh, my belief systems in what what we could be is is I kind of take different aspects around me, uh, historical aspects, um, uh, the, with the, the foundational blocks of, of, of our Constitution, and, and why uh, why we declared independence. Um, I take all of these things and I try to kind of weave a story with them and really um, put them out there and let people see, like, this is who we were, this is who we are, and this is, in your imagination, what we should be. And so, like, the, um, the title, uh, American Veterans of Arkansas, I specifically chose that phrasing because I don't want to be an African-American veteran of Arkansas. I want to be a veteran, an American veteran. And I think historically, um, many, many black people have, um, I'm trying to put this in words, have, have fought for this country to kind of prove their worth as far as citizens um, are concerned. Uh, I've certainly read about it plenty. And, and I think I, I've, I've, I've felt it within my own self. Like I deserve to be a citizen. I deserve respect because I fought for this country. And so when, when I'm in certain areas in this country that may not be so friendly to people of my color, um, I, it's one of the first things that I mention is I'm a veteran in, in hopes that, that they see that my sacrifice is, is more than uh, enough to, to give me some sort of respect. And so I think about when I think about history and history reflecting on this country's history is, is really important to me because it um, it kind of shows how far we've come and how far we have not come in many aspects in, in various ways. Yeah, so absolutely. You know, so as a historian, you know, I've taught uh, American history. I've taught African-American history, military history and a few other types of history. And when I would teach African-American history, a lot of times to go to your point, you know, at the beginning of the first class, I would erase the word African and say, this is an American history class because to go to your point, and I was talking to Christina a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, why would you want me to be the host of a, 
an exhibition about artwork where we want to weave in history. So you're exactly right. And when I thought about you having the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution uh, from 1776 and 1787 and talking about African-Americans in the military, the fact of the matter is African-Americans were fighting in the military at that time, yet they were a people enslaved. And to go to your point, you know, there's a great quote that kind of comes to mind, the Frederick Douglass quote, you know, once let the black man get the U.S. on his person to get the eagle on his button, to get that musket over his shoulder and bullets in his pocket. There is no denying that he has earned his citizenship. And that's in 1863, five years before the 14th Amendment, which you talk about. So uh, it is very complex and very powerful. So I'm gonna jump ahead to uh, my fifth question because you already uh, talked to it. So talk about the type of photography you are using. It's called tintype. It goes back to the American Civil War era. Why use that in 2015 when we have all these 4K cameras? Uh, it's just, it's a conceptual um, allusion to, allusion to uh, history. And, and I think it's safe to say that uh, as a as a black person, African American, whatever your poison is, um, the Civil War was a real turning point for uh, for our race because it, so much blood was shed, and and this the the notion that it wasn't fought uh, because of slavery is absolutely ridiculous because it's in this, the Articles of Secession that the states said it's for slavery. So um, let's put that down really quick. But uh, to, to fight to own a person, um, that time period must have been probably one of the scariest time periods for any black person in this country because we had already been robbed of our homeland and our humanity. But now these, these people were fighting to decide what our true fate was going to be. And so I really wanted to go back to that era with this process. And I've used this process other times. And, and mm -hmm. more or less, the idea is, is for this specifically, let's talk about history way back. Let's talk about transition then and transition now. And what's going on politically and, and the, the movements, this kind of like not second wave, but a, an additional wave of civil liberties and civil rights are being fought um, as we speak. How far have we come? And so I want people to go back and come forward and, and think about it all. Okay, and, and I think that's a great way to look at it because uh, my last question was going to go to social justice that we are dealing with today and how it relates to history. And when you say the Civil War is that turning point, you know, the Civil War is where three of the most important uh, um, uh, amendments were passed as they relate to African-Americans, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Then we had this period called Reconstruction that a lot of people learned that it ends in 1876 or 77. But for some of us historians, Reconstruction has not yet ended because we are still trying to fight it uh, in some ways. Um, and also it took the civil rights movement for a lot of what was guaranteed in the 14th and 15th Amendment, obviously, uh, to come to fruition. So I think that's a great, uh, a great point. Um, so keep social justice in mind. But I do want to talk about some of your images. And I want to start with the first two that's in the intro panel, two images of you. Can, can you walk us through what's going through your mind? Why did you take these two images and what should they mean to the visitor when they come to the exhibition? Okay, uh, so those, those images are actually, believe it or not, the, uh, the precursor to um, this, this series in the Mosaic Templars. Uh, it was my desire to discover myself uh, as a black male, um, and, and in the South, really, uh, I had 
been stationed here uh, initially in 2000 when I first joined the military. This is my first duty station at Little Rock Air Force Base. So um, I kind of knew Arkansas, and then I, I married my wife here. Um, and I have two kids who were born here. So I, I have a history in, in Arkansas, but I didn't, it was never, I never delved into it. So this was my attempt to kind of delve into ideas about being in the South, uh, you know, having been from the North um, and, and being a veteran. I, I think at that time I just moved, or not I think, but I had just moved back to Arkansas after, you know, over a decade hiatus. Um, and uh, what, what was going through my mind was uh, I was actually pretty depressed because um, I, I didn't I didn't really have a future. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. Um, I, I left the military to help my wife uh, and, and to uh, watch the children. And so I, I've got this this stay at home uh, deal going on. And and my desire to make art was, was just it was burning. And I originally wanted to take photos of veterans. Um, it, it didn't really matter whether they were black or not. But I didn't know anybody, and so I thought, okay, well, you know, I'm a veteran. At that point, uh, I was a veteran, um, hadn't joined the military again yet. So I was like, let me just take photos of myself and then just try to weave through the ideas of being in the South and being a black man in the South and being in the woods. And I felt like this connection of, um, you know, I was thinking about, like, uh, how would the possibly escaped slaves have felt being in this wilderness and trying to escape this oppression. Um, but, but here I am now, you know, over a hundred years later, um, wearing a uniform um, in these woods that very well could have, you know, could have the ghosts of the past looking at me, wondering, you know, how far have we come? So those were bouncing in my head. And then like, for instance, the, uh, the, the one of me in the rock, um, the idea of, of hiding behind the giant rock, um, hiding behind the the over, or hiding away from the overseers, and or or you know, um, the, the those who, who tried to bring me back in the uniform, multiple layers, but having being camouflaged, having fought for this country, but still needing a camouflage, and we can go back with that idea, and we can go forward with that idea because I still need camouflage, or we can go to the time when I was in the military. And unfortunately, I still had to deal with racism. So what kind of camouflage did I wear in the military to protect myself from, from these absolute ridiculous notions of racism? And then the one in the water, um, I, I have a, a, a deep connection to the water as far as um, slaves running away from, from the overseer's dogs and running through the water to lose the scent and, and possibly using the water to drink because they have been running all day so I'm thinking about being in the water. And uh, that, that photo in particular, I, I have on my face, I always look serious because <laughs> I, I want to show the gravity of what is happening to me. But on a side note, um, two side notes actually, in each of these photos, um, I have a firearm on me because I didn't know what I would, I would, who I would um, meet in the woods at that point. So I really just did not want to deal with somebody who has a problem with the color of my skin. So I thought, let me just carry a gun. Um, and, and it's pretty sad to think about it, but you know, it's what it is. And then the, uh, the, the, the one of me standing in the water, uh, my face is very serious and I'll be honest with you, I was freezing. <laughs> I'm standing in the water, there's no reason to freeze. And because it's the winter and I was freezing and I'm like, well, if I want to accomplish being, you know, serious, well, <laughs> I sure am because I just want to get out of this right. water. Uh, these are all self-portraits, and they were taken with a uh, pneumatic plunger. And so you can see in my hands um, that I'm like, looks like I'm grasping something, and that's the plunger. I want people to know I'm taking that photo of myself. This is a black male, black person making an image of themselves. And it's very important in all of my work that people understand that I want to tell my narrative instead of having someone else tell that narrative for me. So that's what those uh, I, I, I tell you, I don't know if I can follow that because I will tell you, going back to your quote that I started with, I consider myself an artist and a storyteller using a camera. And, I, you know, I, I looked at those images and just for our audience, you know, 
we had technological rehearsals, but we never talked about exactly what images we would really focus on. And um, I saw some of that in the images, but listening to you bring it out was just awesome. And I could see a lot more, especially as a historian. Now, we started a little late. Uh, we're two minutes over. So I hope Christina doesn't get mad at me, but I do want to focus on two other images really quick and just have you briefly talk about some of the other images in the exhibition. Uh, Nate M, uh, if, if that picture comes up on the screen, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about when you took the image of Nate M. Yes, Nate, uh, <laughs> that's a Colonel, Colonel retired Nate M. <laughs> uh, yeah, the really, says Nate M, but I knew it was Nate McGee. Yep. Yes, Nate, Nate McGee. Um, he, uh, wow, man, what, what, what a, a personality, um, what a presence. And, and you know, having a military background to, to speak to a full bird colonel is, is like, you know, like, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's especially a black full bird colonel. I, I mean, you just, it's, it's such a rare bird. Uh, figuratively speaking, <laughs> um, <laughs> but but what I liked about him was his honesty and um, his happiness. I mean, there there was some pretty negative stuff that happened to him uh, in the military, and I could tell that it hurt him deeply. And he still had this happiness in him. And and I think I, with every black person I, I've met, it seems like all of us have some story of, of a hardship or an oppressive situation that we've been put through, not on our own accord, um, but we all can still smile and be, for the most part, pretty happy. And I think that that's so important um, that, that we continue our, our own personal happiness. And in this photo, it really kind of shone through. And I came, went to his house, and I took this photo and I sat and talked with him and he told me these stories. And, and um, needless to say, I was, I was shocked. Um, you know, I, I'm not nearly as old as him, um, but I, I certainly had my share of, of racist incidents in the military. But, you know, he he's a soldier. He, he, he soldiered on right. and, and I have nothing but respect for him. And this photo, I think, is just very... It's indicative of who he is. I really think yeah, that. And you can see it on his face, and he's a retired full colonel, and several stories come to mind uh, for me. But in the interest of time, and I want to hit one more image, and we'll go to Q&A. Rose Cook. Tell us about the image of Rose Cook, and then we'll turn it over to the Q&A. OK, let's try to be, I'll try to be uh, short-winded. So Rose is, is a wonderful woman. Um, her story was interesting. This is actually in my backyard. And so a lot of these photos that I, I, I took um, were actually in my backyard. And um, more often than not, my, my children were around. My, my wife is a physician, so um, and she works seven days on, seven days off. So, you know, I kind of squeezed it in when I could. Um, those flowers in her hand were actually given to her by my third son. I have five children uh, total. Um, and um, been married, you know, 19 years, uh, same woman. So uh, you know, our, our middle son, literally the middle son, uh, gave her these flowers and uh, she decided to hold them in the photo and I, or either that or, or I asked her to, she was holding them nonetheless. And she has such grace and that's ultimately why I thought it would be such a beautiful image, especially with those flowers. Um, she she was a, a nurse, but at the time when she became a nurse, she was unable to get a commission in the military because um, black people couldn't get degrees in nursing. So okay, she, well, I'll, yeah. Okay, great. Well, you know, outstanding. A lot of interpretations going through my head, but I really wanted to give Christina and you an opportunity to highlight the exhibition. So what I want to do now is turn it over to Christina. And we could go to Q&A. All right. Hello. Welcome. I'm so glad. This was an amazing conversation. I felt like I was like writing notes, 
and learning both about you, but also about military history. Um, so thank you both for being a part of this important conversation that really we hope will be a springboard for more um, conversations about African-Americans um, in the military, but also African-American artists, um, which is just so important, um, which actually was one of my questions I was thinking about was um, really to, to both of you was this idea of representation, because I feel like, um, you know, Kruski, you, uh, you know, working, um, building exhibits, designing those things, and, um, and Ed, you know, participating in exhibits and, and seeing exhibits and obviously going. Um, and so this idea of representation in museums and, and maybe if you could both talk a little bit about maybe what that means to you or what that brings to the conversation. Because I felt like when I was growing up, like I never saw black people in exhibits, right? Unless it was right. kind of a derogatory thing or negative. So to be able to see them in such a positive light feels different and unique to me. Okay, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and start and, and, you know, segue with some of what we heard from Ed. But basically what you guys are doing in the museum uh, with this exhibition and your, your entire museum is showing stories about African-Americans. But to go further, so, uh, you know, Ed talked about growing up and not having that, which you use representation, something to see that would give you pride. So the most important thing to me about museums such as the National Museum of African American History and Culture, such as uh, uh, the museum that I'm at, the first division museum, which is a military museum. But when you said adding more inclusive stories, uh, we've added stories about women, about other minorities. So when people come into a museum, they see that they are a part of this history that Ed is talking about. And you know better than I, Christina, uh, being the director of a museum is, you know, uh, it's, it's a shame to say that uh, one of the recent buzzwords in the last decade has been inclusivity, mm -hmm. inclusive. And so it's important. So young men, women, boys and girls of all backgrounds can go into an educational institution, which is what a museum is, and see themselves. And they'll have that pride from the very beginning, you know, because Ed started off talking about you know, it took him a while to find himself and to be proud of who he was, or who he is, I should say. <laughs> Sorry. Great. Ed, what about you? Uh, to have my work in, in museums is probably the most important uh, drive for me. Uh, first, because uh, I, I'm not this, I'm not driven by, by the desire to make money. I'm driven by the desire to um, to enlighten and push forth humanity, and, and it's it's got a lot to do with with my my Buddhist beliefs, but also um, just this desire to change this narrative and this script. I mean, I wasn't treated badly by the Italian Americans; they treated me very nicely growing up. So where did I get this notion that black was less, and where do I still see this notion, common thread within America? Um, you know, just recently, just today, I had mentioned it to to Christina. Um, the I'm not going political, but the attorney general said, um, you know, the stay at home orders were the akin to slavery. And, and you know, I, I mean, I just it, it just part of the impression pissed me off because I'm like, in no way is it even close to slavery. But but this this it, we're constantly robbed as a people. Of of our suffering and, and who we are and, and even our origins, mm. and we're we're put into this like uh, uh, you forgot to mention, Christina. Uh, we're fetishes in in museums. We're not you know necessarily people. We're fetishes as well. It's, and so um, I wanted to change that that script, and I call it the operating system of this country. It, the operating system badly needs updating. And, and it does not necessarily mean that I have to step on another race to do it because it is inclusive. And, and it's certainly, as a Buddhist, not my intent to ever tell someone else you are less because I am more. It's you and I are the same and we can collectively make each other better. And that's what we should do. But if you're not listening, if you don't see me, if you don't hear me, you can't know. And so I need to change that script so that you do. So that's my drive. 
Yeah, I, I love that, right? I love the ways in which you both kind of think about representation, both in a sort of museum art, but also in a, you know, history text. Because <laughs> um, again, I mean, we don't often get to read about um, black people and black people doing positive things. That's not just about the story of slavery. Um, it's expanding that story. You know, we get people in the museum all the time that they're like, oh, well, I know about black people in slavery and I know about Martin Luther King, but I don't know all the other stories in between and all the other stories before and after. And so being able to let people know that these are folks that are are striving and working and embodying uh, those values, I think it's just so, so profound to me. Um, we got uh, a question from, from one of our uh, viewers about, um, so the question is, what were the reactions you received from the veterans you photographed when you asked them if they would like to be photographed? I know a few of them are, are here commenting in the, so I would love their comments as well about what it was like for you all. I think all of it, not I think, uh, all of it was positive. Um, I think they really understood the gravity of, of what I was trying to accomplish. And I had my share of, of cheerleaders. And I think it was just inspiring. I was inspiring to them. And it kind of it was funny because they were inspiring to me, but I was inspiring to them because uh, I can only imagine that the idea of, of using a photography as, as a way to, to make people look and feel better is a, is, was a great Thing. It was a great feeling, but then also to change this narrative. And I made sure that they understood that I, I'm here to change the narrative with our own voice, not have some other person of another race photograph us and fetishize us, but for me to tell our story. And, and I think everyone totally understood it and they were more than happy and positive about it. Gorski, maybe if you could for a minute, just um, you talked a little bit, I know, Ed, earlier about like tintypes and the role of tintypes. But could you just share a little bit about even just kind of photography, the Civil War, military photography and the ways in which um, maybe it's changed a little bit? I feel like it's different from, you know, when I saw those Civil War photographs from Matthew Brady, you know, pulling bodies places to where we see now um, in Ed Jerusalem. Actually, I think Ed is the expert on the ten types. Um, <laughs> we're talking about, you know, types of images. Uh, but yes, yeah, certainly uh, the images from the American Civil War, which were some of the earlier, uh, earliest images, um, were were ten types. And for Ed to be using it today is amazing because I think it, it it's not an easy task. So I would, you know, kind of kick it over to him to maybe talk about. You know, that's why I asked the question. I was trying to prompt it earlier. You know, I was being <laughs> facetious. Why are you doing 10 types when there's 4K? But, you know, so maybe uh, Ed can talk about how hard that really is. It looks easy for us to look at those images, but tell us how hard it really is to do that, Ed. For you, it's probably it's easy now. No, it's, it's not easy. And it's actually a process that I really don't use very often. Um, I use it for its gravity, and like I've said, I said in the past that my uh, the contextual, the contextual um, uh, reasons behind it. But uh, you, you know, it, it's not it's not a very fast process. It takes anywhere from 30 minutes, 40 minutes to do the whole uh, photo. The people have to sit really still, and that was my favorite part. Is, is asking people to sit still and then seeing them like, <laughs> wave yeah. around. I'm still, and I'm like, you're definitely not still right now. No, no, wait a minute. How did you get, because you started like doing this when you were in Afghanistan. So yeah. like, how do you get people, I mean, what happens if you get called away to like go do something? How do you keep people still in that? So in, in Afghanistan, it was really simple. We, we got a rescue call and I just stopped doing what I was doing and just ran to the, Helicopter. I mean, you just kind of take off one hat and put on another. Um, and, and you know, it's it, it was good. To, it's, it's sad to say, but it was it was a fun time for me. So I'm like, I'm doing something fun, and I'm gonna do something fun. So you know, I just kind of switched hats really quickly. Um, but it, it's it's an involved process, and and oddly enough, the steps to do tin types really made sense to me, especially as an air crew member having to. Um, go through a checklist and, and that's what I do with tintypes. You have to go through a checklist. 
it's a real pain in the butt to do, to be honest. I mean, you can make a, a nice photo. And like with one of the photos, actually, with uh, Marcus, I made a photo of him. And it came out brilliantly. And I went to go varnish it. And the varnish stripped off the flipping collodion. And, and it's because because the collodion had aged. So the chemicals themselves, uh, they age. And when they start aging, they start deteriorating faster. And um, there's so many different things. And then I have to have special camera and equipment to deal with. And, and you know, uh, the collodion, which is the film that holds the silver crystals, um, that has ether in it. And so that's that's always a fun time. In a that small, sounds super uh, dangerous, especially with five kids. I'm just going to say that. Like, yeah, don't do this at home. Time <laughs> goal, but yeah, you're, you're sitting in a small, dark room tent uh, with nothing but ether fumes. So, you know, sometimes it can be fun. Sometimes you need to take a breath. Uh, but, yeah, it's 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 involved. But for I think every photograph needs a reason to exist. And so that's why I, it's not for me. It's not 4K. 4K is easy, you know. Digital is easy, right. but what's the purpose of the photo and why are you doing it? And that is foremost in my brain. Why am I doing this? Great. Got another um, question. It was, um, so what's the, what was the difference between your experience with maybe the oldest veteran um, that you interviewed versus the youngest veteran that you Was there a difference in their experience or even a difference in their stories, or was it more similarities that you saw? Uh, you know, it's it's both. There were similarities. I, I found that the, oddly enough, the older veterans were happiest. And I don't mean happier. I just mean they had more happy. And it's it was I, it struck me as as weird because they had obviously experienced harder times. And maybe that's what it was. They seen the trajectory as as a young person. Um, I don't. I don't have that knowledge of not being able to enter through the front door of a restaurant. But I remember uh, Virgil telling me, because Virgil was really happy, he's one of the, the sitters, that, you know, hey, I, you know, I can't, you know, he's got this kind of way about him and this happy way about him. And he's like, oh, I can't complain. I mean, now I can walk in through the front door of a restaurant. And I mean, that really kind of, you know, it, it, it really, when, when I want to complain about like the injustices, I, think back of those things and i'm like well you know they aren't hanging us wantonly from you know the i've read stories of, of world war ii veterans coming back and being hung in their uniform so it's not that anymore and the older veterans know that and so they're 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 taking what they can get and they're they're using that for their happiness and then the younger younger crowd um they had a little bit more perspective on on the the racism and injustices that have happened and, and maybe a little bit more fire against it, which is reasonable, I would say. Yeah. And just uh, two points to your question, Christina, to add the historical context, one with the American Civil War and one with Ed's comment about the older veterans seemed a little happier. So when you go back to the American Civil War, uh, today we are seeing more and more images of African Americans who served in the USCT, the United States Colored Troops. And there are stories about how these men would walk miles when they found out there was a place where they could go get their image taken. And without those images from the American Civil War, a lot of that would have been written out of history. So the images, and they knew that, the images was going to be a lasting record of their service. There's no way that they can be denied. And that goes to Ed's point. So I would tell you that the reason a lot of the older veterans were probably happier that you came was because some of those who served in World War II, their stories were in fact written out of history. And I'll tell one short yeah. vignette. So we just had the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And for years and years and years, and even all the movies, you never see an African-American face on D-Day. Now, mm -hmm. I'm the executive director of the 1st Division Museum. The 1st Infantry Division was one of the two American divisions that landed on uh, Omaha and Utah Beach. Guess what? There were African-American soldiers with them, mm -hmm. uh, uh, quartermaster soldiers and the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion. So I'll close with this. 
a lot of us have seen this image because I saw this image for about five or six years before I realized who was on the other end. When you see this great panoramic image of D-Day and you see those blimps yeah. over the beach, those are barrage balloons to keep enemy aircraft from strafing the troops. That was the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion. There were African-American soldiers who landed on the first wave and they were written out of history. And recent books, which just came out about five or six years ago, one of the veterans, when he found out he was going to be interviewed, and this is 50 years later, and he simply said, I've just been waiting for someone to come ask me about my story. Mm -hmm. Because for 20 years, no one talked about well, 50 years about African-American veterans landed on D-Day, and they're not the only ones, the 6888 African-American men, uh, the WACs who went overseas during World War II to make sure soldiers can get mail. And I'm going to stop there because there, there are so many stories, which is why what I do as a historian, that have just, I wouldn't say written out of history, they have not been written into history. And that's why museums are important to be inclusive and to go to the point for us who are in public history is to make sure that we weave those stories. Then I placard over here on the right and talk about women right there and African Americans right there and Asian Asian Americans right here. Weave it in. At the First Division Museum, one of the interpretations we added is there are African American soldiers on the beach with all the other American soldiers because they are the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion. And that's throughout history, uh, especially before um, it begins to change around the American Korean War. I love that. I love this, again, this idea of, of really it's telling untold stories. There's so many people in our comments are talking about such important um, history, rich conversations, telling me things I didn't know. I mean, I feel like if I if I were being, you know, not my professional, so I'd be snapping over here <laughs> like, oh my gosh, um, this is so good and so rich and so amazing. And I love this idea of, um, of what you said, right? It's writing into history, like letting people know this is what really happened. I think we were talking earlier about just even the idea that like black soldiers have been fighting before the foundation, but before the constitution is inked on paper, we were fighting for this country. You know, well, let, let, me, let me jump in there really quick. Can I jump in yeah. there and tell the story? Yeah, you know, please. we always yes. hear about the American Revolution in 1775, and someone said, oh no, five years before that, there was Crispus Attucks in 1770. Well, no, it goes back to King uh, William's War in uh, 1698 and all of the other colonial wars, King William's War, King, Queen Anne's War, King George's War, and the French and Indian War. All of those colonial wars before we get to the Boston Massacre and before we get to the American Revolution, African people of African descent have been in those battles. And that's why I was saying earlier that uh, it's, it's very it's simple, but very complex what Ed did to have those documents, because when you read those documents, another quote kind of comes to mind, Abigail Adams, who was the wife and mother of two future presidents. She was the wife of John Quincy Adams and uh, John Adams and the mother of John Quincy Adams. And when she says this quote in 1774, neither one of them are obviously presidents yet. But she says, it always appeared a most iniquitous scheme to me to fight ourselves for what we are denying others. She was not the only American during the American Revolution who realized the hypocrisy of what the American Revolution was about, fighting for freedom against the crown, yet we are holding a people enslaved. And then you go back to the documents that Ed has added to the exhibition and you read the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and you wonder, you know, how was uh, the South with such a smaller population so strong politically? Uh, we know why they were strong economically, a lot of free labor, but the three-fifth compromise was part of the compromise of the eight, 1787 Declaration of Constitution, I should say. And so you had three-fifths of people who had no voice being counted into uh, your political system. So um, a, a lot to well, unpack there. I have to be careful um, being the historian here. So <laughs> you, I'll let, let us move I, I wanted to kind of put a, uh, an end cap on that as well. Um, 
You know what? Uh, an anecdote really quick is that um, one of the, the, the lens that I used, it's a historical lens, 1867 is when it was made. It's a Petzval lens. And um, the guy who, who turned me on to that photo or that, that lens, um, he's a tintype photographer himself. He's one of the, the older, long, he's done it for such a long time. And I remember first meeting him, the, literally the first day I met him, within I'd say about 15 minutes. He, he's an older white gentleman. Um, not that that's important, but interestingly enough, what he told me was, uh, I'll try to quote him correctly, uh, it, it's interesting that you don't talk like those, those others, you don't talk with that Ubonics. And you know, anybody who knows me well, knows that my fuse is about this long for those kind of things. And um, I kept it together because I'm like, this individual is probably going to help me achieve the goal that I have that will directly fight what is in rattling in his empty head. And so um, I kind of took that for what it was. And to this day, when I pick up that lens and I use it to photograph people, I laugh to myself because it's like that old racist geezer, um, he who had the audacity to tell me that to my face, um, I'm using that lens that he he sold me to to break the system that he exists in. Mm. And I don't know if he knows that or he knew that at the time, but you know this this whole this whole narrative of of you know who we are and and, and what you know what they expect of us. And to, to have that expectation, that racist expectation, and I've heard it plenty of times. I'm one of the good ones and, you know, uh, oh, I speak properly. Um, that's, that's what drives me. This, this, that's why I included that, that, that Declaration of Independence, because I think it's an absolute farce that, you know, you can, you can write this declaration and look out the window thinking and see a slave toiling away and think, eh. You know, they're, yeah, you know, they're not people anyways. Continue to write my freedom speech there. That, it drives me. It really does. Can I have two minutes to say something here, Christina? Yeah, please. Okay, and so, you know, to kind of pick up on that, and, you know, that that is a great point, and it goes back to something we said earlier about we aren't hearing each other. And so, you know, Ed mentioned the experience with a white gentleman. The other thing that's important to remember, you know, Abigail Adams was a white woman. And the 13th, 14th Amendment, uh, everyone who passed uh, those amendments were white individuals. So the other thing I think uh, we are strong as a country uh, in is that there have been people on both sides who have always been listening. Um, yeah. And those are the individuals that can make sure that when we have those uh, encounters that Ed has, you know, that, um, you know, that we do what Ed did and become a part of fighting that because I will say and I know that an awful lot of African Americans will say that we all have plenty of mentors and I have a lot of African American mentors but I have a lot of mentors who don't look like me and what I think is so important about this social justice movement is the inclusivity that we see of the individuals who are out there fighting uh, because I can think of a you know a, a couple of other quotes uh, by white individuals in history, uh, such as the commander, Commander Haywood of the 369th uh, Infantry Division known as the Harlem Hellfighters. You know, there are a lot of black soldiers who didn't fight well because of the way the leadership treated them. The 369th, one of the main reasons they fought well was not only because they had great African-American leaders, but their white commanders believed in them. So another thing in this narrative of moving forward we have to tell the inclusive story. Yes, we have been written out of that story quite a bit, um, but also let's look at the other side of the story and how can we change the minds and hearts of some of those individuals who may have racist views and how do we keep everybody in this inclusive circle who don't have those racist views? Yeah, I don't, I don't have an ax to grind. And, and the oh, no. person who I know. me to that individual was, is, 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 is a white man and, and he's the one who inspired me to do tintypes and he's a close friend too. So yeah, I, I definitely, I'm glad you, you pointed that out. It's definitely not one of those things where I'm, I'm 
angry at a, a specific race. What I'm angry at is that some individuals, not all, um, still kind of hang on to these these things right. that are just ridiculous notions. And and you know, it, it, it's either I be angry at that one individual or I am helped along by whoever the individual is to achieve a better goal to like my friends who introduced me, who who's always asking me questions about, you know, race because he wants to understand it, help people like him and help people grow into people like him where they, they're more understanding and more included in this conversation because they're generally interested. So that, that's definitely a, a fine point that that's a great point that you made. So well, like absolutely, because I have three or four examples just like that, and we all do, you know. Uh, one of the things as a historian and what I try to do is, you know, weave in both sides because I think most of us, if not all of us as African Americans, have those same stories, uh, but we have the other stories as well. So I was just, you know, putting yeah. uh, the yeah. circle context on the conversation. Sounds a great point. Yeah, I love so now this. People see, Ed and I, we, we didn't rehearse this. We're having a conversation. <laughs> just, it's, it's just no, I love it. I love that we're having a conversation. I tell people, I'm like, we're live. We're doing this. We're we're trying this. This is new territory for museums. And with that, like, I just want to thank you both for um, being here, for being present, for having a conversation, um, for really starting a conversation for us. Um, I want to remind folks that you can see the exhibit um, in person. We are open to the public. You know, wear your face mask, but we are open to the public from um, 10 o'clock a.m. to 4 p.m., uh, Tuesday through Saturday. And so we want to invite you to come to see the, the exhibit in person. I saw um, a number of our veterans were that participated in the exhibit were on the feed um, just sharing about um, how much they appreciated the work and being a part of it. So I want to also just say thank you, thank you, thank you for their willingness to participate in this project. I think when Ed and I were talking about this like two years ago, we both had this look like, uh, are people going to do this? Um, yeah. <laughs> are they going to yeah. buy, buy into what we're trying to do and see this vision? So, so thank you for you all doing that. And related to that, I want to give a, um, a shout out to um, retired Colonel Anita, Anita Deason, who I saw was on here um, for her work in this project and helping us, as well as um, Dr. Stella Morris, who also um, participated in the project and helped um, at Connect with Veterans. So again, thank you all for being a part of um, our very first uh, virtual uh, opening event. And please do come out to see the exhibit. You can learn more about our uh, museum and the exhibit by visiting mosaictemplarcenter.com. And again, we're open to the public Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, shortly after this video is posted, probably tomorrow, um, we'll have it posted on our page. So we encourage you, um, if you enjoyed this conversation, if it meant something to you, please share it. Please encourage your friends, your family um, to watch it, um, to comment, to let us know um, if they wanna see more things like this, because we are a community uh, built museum, community based museum, and we respond to what our community wants to see and, and hear and learn about. So. So please be sharing uh, this event and thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.